Matt Cardona, man. Welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me. I was a little late. So my, my nickname is always ready, but not always on time, you know? Well, to be fair, I'm always early to like everything. Okay. My wife yeah. hates it. She's like, we don't have to be the first person there. Uh, but it just, it's ingrained in me, man. But uh, with that being said, I, I first want to point out congratulations to the shout out at the Emmys. Bro, unbelievable, right? Uh, I got a big match coming up with uh, Paul Walter Hauser, star of Cobra Kai. Um, yeah, we have a match and uh, he just called me on the Emmys. Not just called me out, but said he was going to beat me, you know, pretty much embarrassing me. My phone blew up. I was like, what is going on here? Because I have a podcast myself and I was recording Monday night and I got all these texts like that I was called out the end. He's like, what are you talking about? But sure enough, there's the video. Paul just just saying he's going to beat me live on the Emmys. Unreal. Unreal. And then I also want to congratulate you on turning out merch so quickly as the Emmy God. Like, let's absolutely. talk a little bit about your merch game, man. <laughs> like, it's absolutely unbelievable how quickly you turn things around, how on top of it you are. Have you always been that innovative person when it comes to business? Or was it, I have to learn on the fly once you left WWE? Well, I think, you know, growing up a wrestling fan, I collected all this stuff, right? So whether it be shirts or foam fingers or the action figures, I was always a huge collector of that. Um, and then while in WWE, I was fortunate enough to get a lot of that stuff and I was fortunate to be hands-on with some stuff, but in WWE and in life, there, there's ups and downs. So when you're on the, you know, at a downtime in WWE, they're not making merch of you, you know, you, you get no merch. So it's like, oh, uh, it was kind of like frustrating in that sense. So not that I had any handcuffs on in WWE, I'm not saying that, but once I was let go, if I had handcuffs on, they were certainly off and I was able to get things going like i had you know before i was officially fired i had my t-shirt uh store already up like ready to wow. press live like i was ready to go you know so you did you know it was coming did you know that release was coming down the pipeline so you're like i gotta prepare for this like how long were you ready no so i i did not see it coming um this was like the beginning of the pandemic so i think it's like april 15th is the the day 2020 and uh, Vince McMahon, who was in charge of WWE at the time, he put out a statement basically saying cuts were coming. I'm like, OK, well, I'm like, all right, they're not really doing much with me. Uh, I had it resigned my contract. It was about to expire that like July or August. I'm like, all right, well, it's probably coming today. So let's get let's get ready for it. Yeah. And so obviously one thing that that I applaud you for is when you left WWE, you went to the indies, right? And a lot of times people go to the indies and they disappear or right. they're not they popping up on somebody's obscurity. radar. Yeah, it's it's yeah. absolutely crazy. And you were able to not only raise the level of awareness of who Matt Cardona is, but you had to find out who Matt Cardona was, then transformed right. into the Deathmatch King and then Indie God. And you literally have found a way in the indie scene, which is super interesting. And I think this correlates to, to entrepreneurship. You've been able to tell a story and arc your character across multiple platforms, across multiple wrestling companies. How were you able to do that versus these other wrestlers who are like, hey, next show, next show, I'm showing up, next show, I'm showing up. So, you know, I get fired in uh, April 2020. And usually, like you said, someone gets fired from WWE. They go right to the independents. But... We're living in this global pandemic. The whole world shut down. There were no independents. I'm sure there were a couple running with the social distancing and the mask. I'm like, I don't want to, I don't want to do that. You know, like, seven people in the crowd standing yeah, six feet apart. If it's not safe to, to, you know, leave your house, I probably shouldn't be doing these independent wrestling shows, you know? And also, like you said, I didn't want my first, my first matches outside of WWE to be in these spread out high school gyms with nobody there. I didn't want that, you know? So uh, I took some time off and uh, once the world opened back up, I knew like, who is, who's Matt Cardona going to be? I knew I needed a change. I didn't know what that change was. Obviously uh, I had to change my name because in WWE, they own your, your, your intellectual property. It's theirs, right? So Zack Ryder was theirs, which was fine. I went by my real name, but what, what was I going to do? Like, am I just... Zach Ryder with a different name. I didn't want that, you know, and I knew I didn't want that, but I didn't know what change I needed until I was uh, approached by this company called GCW to do a, a death match. And for those who don't know what a death match is, it's pretty much what you think it is. Yeah. You know? yeah Google really, it. 
Very, yeah, very violent. You know, there's light tubes involved, pizza cutters, blood. And my my knee jerk reaction was, I don't want to do this. Like, no way, absolutely not. And then I took a step back and said, This is exactly what I need to do. This will get people talking. Um, this will get people interested. I didn't I didn't know how much buzz we were gonna get. We ended up, you know, that particular show. Uh, it trended on Twitter over the UFC and the Olympics, which I'm like, what? Insane. Me, me get my 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 ass kicked. But it was that show that really not just changed my career, it ended up changing changing my life, really. Yeah. So you talk a lot about growing up being a wrestling fan and and obviously being aware of the back end of it. There's there's merch, there's storytelling, there's all these things. Do you feel sometimes when you're creating that next arc for yourself or that next character, there's still like little Matt Cardona in there being like, this is what I've always dreamed of now that you have full control? 100%. So for instance, that particular death match, right? I knew, okay, it's a death match. I'm going to bleed, most likely. If there's light tubes and pizza cutters involved, I will bleed. So I wore, strategically, I wore all white, like a white t-shirt, uh, white jeans, like it was a street fight. So I wasn't in traditional gear, but I knew I'd get a couple trickles of blood on it. My white shirt turned maroon. That's how bloody it was. And I thought, well, Hey, I can't keep this right. It's not like my WrestleMania trunks that I can keep forever. I can't keep this bloody shirt. There's something, there's something I can do with this. And I thought back to when I was a kid and at WrestleMania after WrestleMania, when there was a new champion, they would cut up the ring canvas they make an ice plaque with a photo of the champion and they'd sell it. And I said, wouldn't it be cool? I just became the GCW champion. We have that picture. And I cut up the t-shirt and make a plaque. And I contacted the company who actually makes the WrestleMania plaques for WWE. So they knew exactly what I was talking about. We made the plaques and I'm not going to disclose how much money I made, but I made a lot of money. Yeah, I bet. Of, you know, so a lot of it is stuff that, I would have wanted as a fan and not all my ideas work. You know, I call myself the deathmatch King. I thought it'd be great. Hey, what if I make Burger King style crowns that I could sell at my merchandise table? I thought I'd be like selling out of these and reordering. I have to give them away. I have to give them away. <laughs> Nobody wants these things, you know? So yeah, you win some, you lose some. Yeah, obviously, look, going to the indies is going into business for yourself. You're no longer, although they say WWE superstars are not employees, like you're officially on your own, right? Like you're out right. there and you're creating it yourself, which is risk reward. Sure. Um, you know, and, and that's exactly what the Burger King crowns you're talking about, right? I took this risk. It didn't work out. Have to move on. Let's talk a little bit about that mindset, man, because I'm sure there's things that you've tried on the indies other than, look, we've talked about the popular things, Deathmatch Death King, Indie God, all these things. I'm sure there's things you've tried that have fizzled out. Like, how do you quickly rebound from that so it doesn't bury you at the bottom? I think with me, especially now being on the independence, it's like, okay, I'll try anything. And if it doesn't work, I don't like harp on it. You know, okay, let's move on to the next thing. Right now, for instance, um, we talk about nicknames, uh, Deathmatch King, Indie God. I thought it would be cool. Ooh, there's all these free agents. What if I call myself the agent, you know, and like I got a trademark, spent thousands of dollars. On, it didn't take off. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I own it. I have a, a t-shirt with it, but it just didn't work. Okay, that's it. Move on. Come up with something else. Yeah. And you're, you're really paving the way for so many wrestlers at this point to go. You don't need to be signed by one of the big companies. You don't need to be signed by WWE, AEW, whatever other, you know, wrestling company you want to talk about. You can go and make it on your own. Are you noticing now people going, okay, Matt's doing this. Let me follow the model. Yeah. And you know, the, the model, um, you know, I didn't invent this. There's guys who, who came before me who reinvented themselves on the Indies, but I do think, I reinvent, reinvented the model as it as it comes to merchandise and making money outside of the actual physicality of wrestling. You know, when I go to these shows, I realize, okay, I need to make a connection with this audience. So like I will, we call them gimmick tables. So before the show starts an hour or so before I set up my table, I sell my merchandise. I'm there interacting with these people, whether they hate me or love me, you know, they're getting that interaction and then they're buying a t-shirt or a foam finger or an action figure. And, uh, you know, I think the connection is the most important thing, because if you come through that curtain and they don't love you or hate you, like, what are we doing here? You know, like, yeah. I understand it's wrestling. So 
you have to have a good match. I get that. I'm not saying don't have a good match. But when I get to these shows and I see these people in the back, like, you know, talking over their match or planning their match, I'm thinking, why don't you do, why don't you go out there and, and try to make a connection with his audience and, and also make some extra money? Yeah. What, what was it like? Let's go back to the WWE days when you started and you launched your YouTube channel yeah. and you really began to blow up your character and people really started to be attracted to, you know, Zack Ryder at the time you were the internet champion. You were, yeah. you were gaining a following and then WWE was, they do it time and time again, right? You're not the only victim of this. I know but, it's coming, <laughs> but you, yeah, man, you, you build your own hype and then they squash it. What was that like internally for you when you had to just suck it up and push through? Yeah. So at that time, uh, this is the beginning of 2011. Like I said, a lot of highs and lows in wrestling. You can't always be on top. Right. And this was a, uh, a time where I was at the bottom, literally at the bottom of the card. And I wasn't happy with my spot and I wanted to do something about it. And I had this idea to, to start this YouTube show. I didn't anticipate again, kind of like that death match, how much steam and how much momentum it, it would get. Uh, and it was just something stupid that I started where it was just me, you know, based the first episode, I'm just in my, my living room, film talking to my, uh, my flip camera at the time, I'm dating myself here at the flip camera. Wow. <laughs> We're going way back. By the way, when yeah. you said 2011, I was like, holy shit. I can't yeah. believe it was that long ago. 2011, yeah. So, you know, then I started doing skits or uh, making self-deprecating jokes or incorporating my my friends and family into the show, uh, you know, letting the fans in on other things I like, like Star Wars or action figures. So instead of just, like, the guy they see getting beat in a couple minutes on Monday Night Raw, now they had something to sink their teeth into. They were rooting for me. You know, they wanted to see me on TV. So they started chanting my name at shows that wasn't at or making Zack Ryder signs and holding them up on TV. And, uh, you know, by the end of the year, I was the United States champion all because of that show. And then, you know, like you said, uh, <laughs> I don't know if the word squashed is the right word. And, and, and at the time, I certainly was very, if you would have asked me at the time, I would have said yes. They're burying me. They're squashing me, blah, blah, blah. But now, looking back, I feel like I need to just blame myself for what happened because I, I don't want to be someone who, this guy held me down or that person did that. I don't want to be that guy. Um, I like to hold myself accountable. So, you know, for instance, when all that was going down and the YouTube show was still popular and then I started, like, losing again on TV, literally, like, they had this character, Kane, who every week would, like, whether he beat me up so bad, I was in a wheelchair. Then he rolled me off the big entrance stage in that wheelchair. Right. So instead of bitching and moaning, like I was doing like on social media and stuff like that, or behind the scenes, like to my friends, I should have just been man enough to, to knock on Vince McMahon's door. Be like, Hey Vince, like what's going on here? I'm working my ass off. I I'm one of the top merchandise sellers. I'm very popular making money for this company. Like, what's going on. But I didn't do that. So I can't blame anybody for what happened but myself because i didn't do what i needed to do to at least question it at the time yeah i was bitching and moaning to anyone who would listen if we did this interview in 2013 or 2012 whenever i probably was, yeah they buried me but that's not how i feel now now looking back you know i buried myself for not you know uh being man enough to ask what was going on i i, I like to hold myself accountable not just for that but for anything that goes right or wrong in my life yeah. And I think that that's such a lesson for people to hear, right? Take ownership, take ownership of everything you've been through. And and since you can take ownership of the past, you can take ownership of the future, right? And you can yes. create your path going forward, which is what you've, what you've done over and over and over again. It's funny. I post, um, when I have a, a cer certain guest on my show, I'll post on my Facebook page, Hey, what should I ask them? And I said, Hey, I'm interviewing Matt Cardona. So to the wrestling fans out there, what should I ask him? And somebody right. commented and said, I love Chelsea green. That's all they well, said. So, put a, so do I. <laughs> put, a, I put a heart. Now, I, I'm bringing this up for a reason, right? You are a very busy man. You're busier now than probably you've ever been in your life. Yeah. Chelsea's very busy with WWE, traveling with them and doing shows. How do you guys figure out? Let's talk relationship. Like, how do you guys figure out relationships? How do you find the balance? How do you find the time for each other? So when we first started dating, you know, seven years ago, we were – both the same thing, two wrestlers on different schedules. So that's how our relationship has been the whole time. So the only time we were ever on the same schedule was when we were both fired from WWE. And even then we did different shows. Most of the time we were traveling together, but I would say 50, 50, we'd be on different shows over the weekend. 
So now, yeah, I, I'm not going to pretend that it's the easiest thing in the world. It's certainly not. But we know, okay, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, those are our definite days. Let's maximize those days. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a challenge where, you know, for instance, she has a weekend off. Well, she wants to go to this wedding. Well, sorry, babe, I'm in Australia. You know, like, <laughs> but we're just used to that. And luckily, because we're both wrestlers, we know it comes with the territory. Yeah, obviously the understanding of what your partner needs at any given time. But I love the idea of just being in the moment, right? Like sure. understanding this is the time we have. We have to make sure we lean into it, right? Is that a lesson you've learned over time? Or is it like, this is just who I am because I've been traveling for the last 20 years of my life wrestling? Yeah, I think that's just, you know, because of the schedule I've had where I try to, you know, listen, don't get me wrong. There's certainly nights where I love to just do nothing sit on the couch with my dogs, watch movies. But like when I'm home, I try to, to maximize it because uh, the schedule is, it's pretty grueling. So, and I hate to use this term. Does, do people still say YOLO? <laughs> but like, <laughs> they don't, but we can bring it back. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> y- like let's go, you know, like y- you do only live once. So why not, you know, make the most of it? Yeah, for sure. So when you're, when you're thinking into your creative world of, of wrestling, how often do you pull from, outside things that you see or experience, whether it be movies, things that you knew from your childhood, obviously the indie God, you wear the Indiana Jones hat. Like how often do you pull from other things that you absorb? Yeah. So you brought up the indie God. It's a perfect example right here. You know, the, that was supposed to be a one night, like ha ha outfit, you know, like the month before I did back to the future outfit. I'm like, Oh, let me do uh Indiana Jones this month, but I'll call myself the indie God. And I, you know, I had the hat, uh, the whip, the, I, I cut the jacket into a vest, put my logo on it. But I realized that like people were talking about it uh, on, online. And like, cause I wasn't coming out like laughing, like, look at me. I'm an like, I, you watch me. I, I'm mean mugging the whole time. Like, I don't think it's a joke. You know, I look ridiculous with this hat and this whip, but I'm not having a good time. You know, like, I mean, inside, of course I am, but the character, Matt Cardona is still angry and, and violent. And I think that's what made it work. And I said, well, why don't we just keep doing this and see what happens? And now, you know, it's been a whole year. I, I was on the cover of Pro Wrestling Illustrated this year dressed as that indie guy, <laughs> which will be a one night outfit. So, so to answer your question, sometimes, sometimes I do take from things that I'm passionate about or I'm a fan of, but other times, you know, it's just like an accident. Like that was just a happy accident. I knew I was going to do it for that one night, but it turned into a whole year of my life. Yeah, dude, I love that. And so, you know, obviously listening to some of the things you're a fan of, there's Star Wars, there's Indiana Jones, Back to the Future, all these things. How does somebody who calls himself the the Deathmatch King become a Disney adult? Yeah. <laughs> well, in wrestling, the term is heat, right? When, when, when the fans don't like you, you know, you have heat. And the heat in this whole Deathmatch King is that, I've only had one death match. Yeah. I beat, I beat the King and that's it. You know, and I call myself the death match King and the, you know, the, the fans online, the haters, Oh, you only did one death match. Well, yeah, that's, that's the whole gimmick. <laughs> that's the, that's the point. That's why you don't like me. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And in fact, when I won the, that GCW title after that death match, the first thing I did was get on a plane and go to Disneyland. And I posed in front of the castle with that title. So you talk about heat. That's some heat right there. That is heat, man. So let's talk. Let's talk about that. And the reason I bring it up is because I'm I'm a Disney adult. Oddly enough, um, it's not. I don't wear the Disney T-shirts, but I love Disney World. I actually I'll be there next weekend. Oh, wow, but okay. I was looking through your Instagram and I saw you had lunch with or dinner with a bunch of friends at Boathouse, and Ricky was your waiter. Oh, I know yeah. Ricky. Oh yeah, I do. So he was also my waiter and my family's waiter, along with a, another family friend of ours uh, for Thanksgiving this year. Oh wow, Ricky's so, the best. Dude, Rick, Ricky is the best man. So Ricky, he's listening. It, well, it's funny because the night that we were there, he's like, dude, what's your podcast? I'll subscribe. So maybe he will check it out. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Yeah, dude. I love it. So, you know, obviously I, I want to talk a little bit about that mindset because I think people look at grown men who love Disney World and they go, what's wrong with you? Um, right. But I feel like I draw inspiration for my businesses, for my talks sure. that I give on stages, all that stuff. Do you draw inspiration when you go there? Or you're just like, you know what? I'm going to eat churros and ride rides. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't really, you know, I never really thought about that before, but I'm sure I do draw some inspiration, you know? Um, listen, I totally get it. If you have never been to Disney world and you're an adult and you go and you don't properly plan and you're there and it's hot and there's long lines, it's expensive. I can understand why you don't like it, 
but you know, you and I were fans. So like, I know all the tips uh, and tricks, you know, I, I'm not waiting in those long lines. Also, I, I live in Florida. So it's like, if space mountain is a 60 minute wait, I'm like, Oh, I'll just do it next time. You know what I'm saying? So it's totally different, but being there for sure. It's, you know, it's, it's the, the innovation, the nostalgia. It's all I like, kind of wrapped into one, you know, you like space mountain, perfect example, this, this nostalgic classic attraction, right? I can enjoy that just as much as I love the new guardians of the galaxy cutting edge coaster, you know? And I think in wrestling, uh, especially in my career, it's definitely uh, a mix of nostalgia and innovation. Yeah. You know, they say in wrestling, a lot of times the greatest characters are, are is a person turned up times sure. 10, right? Like, especially in the attitude era, everybody says, Oh, I just found out who I was, my voice. And I turned it up times 10 right. uh, and, and it goes till today. But obviously you look, you have action figures behind you. You've got a podcast about it. You go to Disney, you do all these things, but in the ring, you're the, you're the bad guy. You're the guy who draws the heat. Right. Right. How do you find that balance when you leave the ring to not still be that person or vice versa? Well, I think, you know, my, my thing is that in the ring, people, a lot of people don't like me because I'm that guy outside the ring, the guy who collects figures or goes to Disney. So that's just, it's more fuel to the fire. You know what I'm saying? So it's not like I'm pretending to be this, can I say asshole? I'm not, pre- yeah. I'm not pretending to be this evil villain. I'm being me and they just don't like me for me. Does that make sense? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, and, and it's great. So obviously earlier you were talking about the pandemic and how it shut things down and you had to kind of put it in neutral and say, Hey, okay, I'm going to take some time off, but you had the podcast at the time. Right. Now, how long were you doing the podcast before that? Did you realize the potential financially? Did you realize the potential, what it could do for you? Like, where were you at? Because I'm going to kind of give you context. So 85% of my income before COVID was speaking and I host a live event for entrepreneurs. So that's 85% of my business Right, gone for two years, just wiped out, right? I had to rebuild. Um, And so now I look back and I go, thank God for that moment because I was able to go, okay, now I can monetize all these other things that I was missing. Right. So how... What was that like for you? Were you already aware or did you just have to turn it up? So we start the podcast. We, uh, Brian Myers, who's my lifelong, I shouldn't even say lifelong friend, car- a career long friend. My whole career started training with him. We made it to WWE together. We got fired together. <laughs> um, we started the podcast in the summer of 2018. And it's just something I wanted to do. Kind of like a creative outlet thing. I did not think about money at all. I did not think. You know, I thought this would be a 45 minute show. You know, we do it once a week on the road because we're BS texting and talking about toys anyway. Like, let, let's just put it, put it on, uh, you know, let's put it out there. See if anyone else would listen to it. Um, I had learned from the YouTube show, you know, okay, we can't do this as Zach Ryder and uh, Kurt Hawkins because WWE will own it. In fact, we did try to present it to them and pitch it to them. Hey, let's make this, this show. And they, they just had no interest in it. So all right, we'll do it on our own. But hey, let's be Matt and Brian, right? So that way, I wasn't even thinking that we're going to get fired. But I'm thinking, no matter what, it's ours. Right? Yeah. It's 100% ours. So we had the show for about a year and a half, two years, and then we get fired. And luckily, we had it as Matt and Brian, because if it was Zach and Kurt, it'd be done when we got fired. Yeah. So, so I'm thinking, all right, I'm fired. We still got this podcast. But, you know, times are tough. Who's going to be who's gonna be buying collectibles? Turned out everybody was and we our podcast blew up and like the collectible market just exploded whether it be for video games action figures trading cards and that's when we saw the biggest boom in our business and before that we'd realize oh we can make t-shirts we could do live shows so we realized we, there was money to be made but yeah when the podcast happened i'm sorry when the pandemic happened we had the podcast we're like okay there's, there's a lot more we can do. We ended up starting our own wrestling toy company. You know, we, we, we even tried doing wrestling shows like in during the pandemic, cause everything was closed set shows. And, and my partner, Brian owns a wrestling school. So I go, why don't we just, if, if WWE is doing it a close set, why can't we, you know, yeah. so we did a couple during the pandemic that were very successful. Then when the world opened back up, we quickly realized we know nothing about running shows and we lost a lot of money, <laughs> but the first two were great. Yeah. So, you know, it's so interesting that you bring up, you know, the pandemic brought back collectibles. Like when I was a kid, I I collected baseball cards. I still have all of them. Uh, Found out none of them are worth anything. Um, But with that being said, like, you know, it really brought back collectibles. And I think it was everybody, again, going into neutral and going, I need a hobby. Like I, uh, what are the hobbies I did as a kid? Let me see if I can bring them back. So for you, talking about collectibles, talking about toys, talking about all these things, what's the holy grail? 
for you to go out and get as a toy if you don't have it yet? And if you do, what is it? I do have it. In fact, um, it's this this wrestling figure uh, of Greg the Hammer Valentine. The the story behind it is that it was in a WWF magazine in the the Toys R Us ad, like the new tag teams coming soon, and he was pictured on that. But when you went to the toy store, he wasn't there. So for years, I re- I just thought I couldn't find him. I later learned through the internet that th- th- he just didn't come out. They didn't make it. So I was able to track down through the internet and all the like the underground like message boards and facebook groups i was able to find somebody who was selling that great the hammer valentine hand-painted prototype from that toys r us ad uh so that is my holy grail not i'm not even a big greg the hammer valentine fan in fact i've said that publicly before and last year at uh wrestlemania he came up to me at the hotel bar trying to fight me like thought i was like talking trash i'm like greg no no disrespect (laughs) i'm not saying i'm not a fan of you it's just like I wasn't buying this figure because I'm this huge Greg the Hammer Valentine fan. It's just it was the the missing piece to this collection that nobody else had, and I needed it. Dude, I love it. I love I love, I love how it offended him because you were like it. not a huge fan. Yeah, I think he was taking it like as an insult, you know. And uh, it wasn't that I am not a fan. I'm just not a fan, if that makes sense. But you know, the thing about the podcast and the collectibles is that you know. Back to the Future is not real. We can't go in a DeLorean, right? But by going on eBay, and whether it be a, one of the baseball cards you had or an action figure I had, you can relive these childhood like moments. Like, oh, this Ultimate Warrior I got for my birthday, you can do it again. Or maybe you didn't get the Ultimate Warrior for your birthday, and now you can. You know, you can almost like redo and rewrite history. So it's pretty fascinating. Yeah, it's like I have money now. I can actually go right. out and buy these yeah. things I've wanted my whole life. Yes, the, right. And it was it's so funny because growing up, I don't so obviously I'm from Philadelphia area, so I love the Phillies. My my favorite player growing up was Lenny Dykstra. And so I have like 150 plus of his cards, right. which are worth four cents each because <laughs> he's gone on to be a criminal and ended up in jail and all these things. Right. So you never really know, but right. But I, I feel like there's this sense of like you said, nostalgia, I think is real. I don't know how, like, how old are you? You're in your thirties, right? Yeah. I'm 38. Okay. So I'm 39. So we're right around the same age, probably yeah. grew up in the same era of wrestling, but I think for people our age, nostalgia is becoming so real. Um, Absolutely. and I, I'm, I feel like I'm living in it. I think that's my new obsession with Disney and going there often and all those things, which I love, man. So thank you for keeping it alive. Yeah. I mean, listen, uh, I'm just a big kid. I'm somebody who, who never grew up. You know, so all the stuff that I'm passionate about now is stuff I was passionate about as a kid, whether it be the toys or like the the movies. And I love that, like, you know, they're making a new Ghostbusters, you know, after all these years, you know, and I love the theme parks. And and I do I do appreciate, like you said, like the old rides, like a Space Mountain or Pirates of the Caribbean. But I do love when they're they're innovating and they're adding, you know, Tron or the uh, the Guards of the Galaxy Or, you know, even Universal, these theme park wars going on. Like, who's going to build the next big thing? Like, I love it. Yeah. I mean, they're dumping a ton of money into the theme parks to to win it out. And who's going to who's going to win in the end? Nobody knows. You know what I mean? I I, I love living in it, though. It's great. (laughs) It is, dude. Have you? So there's a apparently not that we're here to talk about theme parks, but apparently there's a Super Mario Brothers theme park that is opened. Yeah, so it's there's one. It's the Universal um, in Hollywood, but there's also one in Japan. So uh, this past fall, when I was wrestling in Japan, I stayed an extra day, and uh, and I did it. And they're they're building it in Orlando, so it should be here in, a, in like a year or two. That's all. how was it? It's, the The actual land is unbelievable. Like if if you've been to like the, the Harry Potter or the Star Wars, I think it blows those out of the water. Uh, I think the ride is. <laughs> I'm going to go on record saying the most disappointing uh, ride in theme park history. (laughs) I think it's like the worst ride ever, but I think the land is incredible. What's the, what is the ride? It's like a, like a Mario Kart. Okay. Yeah. That's what I saw. I can't even describe it because like you're wearing these, I don't even want to call them 3d goggles. They're more like virtual reality goggles. It's just, it's a swing and a miss in my opinion, but Hey, I'm not making these theme park rides. I'm just riding them. That's it. So we'll, one more question about theme parks slash Disney, and we'll, and we'll move on. What is your favorite park, and what is your favorite ride in Disney? Let's go Disney only. We're talking got to be specific. Disney, Disney World. World. Disney World. Favorite park would be uh, the Hollywood Studios. And I think I think the Tower of Terror is the, the, 
the perfect ride. Yeah. You see it from the distance. Like even right now, I can just picture like walking down the street, seeing it from a distance, you know, the, the, the queue, the line is very well themed, the, the anticipation to ride this ride. It, it, it you, you get it from the, the moment you, you see the, the tower, right? The hotel, uh, the ride delivers that has a great gift shop. So I think it's uh the perfect ride, the perfect attraction. It is good. I I uh, I want to say Guardians is mine, but I feel like that's yeah. such a cop out. It's a great roller it coaster. It's a cop out. It I is a think, cop out. I don't think it could be on anyone's list. It's it's too good. It's too good. It's too new. That can't. You, but Guardians doesn't count. Okay, so if uh, if I'm gonna go old school, Space Mountain. Okay. Is pretty epic, and so we were just there over over Thanksgiving this last year. Me, the kids, and and wife, and I. Every time I ride Space Mountain, I go. I forget how good it is. Yeah, I, I actually I can't even say this. I love the Disneyland one way better because they 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 gutted it and the new track, so it's so smooth. Uh, the, this Disney World one, the older we get, oh boy, it's rough. It's rough. It's rough. <laughs> it is. But dude, I want to I want to future cast with you here a little bit. Obviously, you're killing it on the indies. You've uh, I was looking it up because I'm like, yo, if he shows up, if I interview him on the 18th and he shows up to the Rumble, but yeah. you're booked out on the indies till July. So I'm like, I don't yeah. know if this is happening. I'll be, I'll be on the Jericho cruise during the Royal Rumble week. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. yeah. So with that being said, man, do you ever see yourself back working with WWE? So listen, uh, I've said this before, whether you you dictate or categorize or describe success by by money, by accolades, by happiness, no matter what, this is the most successful I've been in my career. Um, that being said, I'd be lying if I never wanted to have a, a WrestleMania moment again or wrestle in Madison Square Garden again. You know, a, as fun as this is, I would love to end my career in WWE. You know, for instance, this past Christmas, uh, Chelsea and I, I'm from New York. We went to visit family in New York, spent Christmas. It was great. The next day, she's wrestling in Madison Square Garden. I'm like, well, shit, I'm going home. You know, yeah. so that part, that part sucks, but uh, I'm having so much fun now, but definitely like if there was a phone call right now, I'd pick it up and we'd have a conversation. But I think um, the situation would have to be right. I don't want to go back just to go back. You know what I'm saying? Like, especially at this time in my career, like if I was about to retire, sure, I'll go back just to go back. But right now I feel like I'm in the prime of my career. Maybe haven't even hit it yet which is crazy to say because i'm 20 years in um but yeah i don't i don't want to just be another guy on the roster been there done that and nothing against the people who are doing that you know collecting the paycheck i get it i did it before but at this point in my life and career i need so much more than that yeah no and i and i get it too and obviously right now in wwe there's a lot of guys at the top like it wouldn't be like, oh, Matt Cardona's back. Let's let's shoot him to the moon. I mean, there's it's crowded for the first right. time in a really long time, and it's a good thing for wrestling. But I would love to see the person you are now, or the performer you are now, in WWE because I think it would absolutely destroy what you've done. Not that what you've done wasn't great, IC champion, US champion, but to see this this iteration of you in WWE, I think would be a whole new level. So fingers crossed, one day we see you there, man. That's hey, that's my own never. outlook. As Justin Bieber says, never say never. That's that's it. So you're a believer too. We'll put that's that right. on the record. That's right. So I want to ask you a question that I ask every single person on the show. It's a two part question. Sure. The first part is what is your definition of success? Mm. And the second part is what are three things you do every single day to ensure that success for yourself? I think it's kind of something we just described. It's like uh you wrap up happiness, you wrap up accolades, right? You wrap up you know, financial success and you put it all together. Right? It's not just one thing to me, right? Like if to me, happiness is number one, if I, if they all had to go, right. We all need money to live. I'm not saying, I'm not saying I want to be living on the streets by any means. Right. But I think happiness is my definition, my ultimate definition of success. Uh, and, and three things that I do every single day. Listen, I, I, I wish I could sit here and lie to you and pretend that I, I that I have this regimen that I'm doing every single day. No, I think just I was somebody who not naturally overly positive. You know what I'm saying? Like I see I see the glass half empty. Not, not to this day. I do when I right. Mm. Um, but I have to convince myself to be positive. I almost have to train myself to be positive. And that just honestly just takes practice. Uh, I'm also somebody who legit followed my dream, right? Like I knew from a very young age 
that I wanted to be a pro wrestler. And everyone thought I was, of course, when you're a little kid, five years old, yeah, sure, man, I want to be a wrestler, sure. But when, when I'm in high school and, you know, the rest of my friends are going to college and I'm like, no, I still want to do this wrestling thing. You know, like I always just for some reason believed it was going to happen. And that's with me not being a positive person, you know, naturally, I just knew like, this is going to happen. I don't care how it's going to happen. I don't care when it's going to happen, but it's going to happen. And fortunately for me, it happened very quick. You know, I started training at 18. I was, I signed my WWE contract at 20 years old, just, just about wow. 21. So I was very, very fortunate. So I, I, I literally, you know, grew up in WWE. Like my whole adult life was in WWE. I, I grew up as a man. I grew up as a performer, uh, you know, everything. I, my whole adult life was working in WWE. So when I did get released, it was kind of like, well, here we go. Now it's, it's, it's chapter two of my adult life and to see what I can do for myself. And I, not to toot my own horn, but I'm very proud of what I have accomplished outside of WWE, but it's cause I don't stop. Right. So in WWE or not just WWE, anyone listen to this, whatever job you're in, there's only so many things you can control. Right. And like we were talking about before, when the YouTube show kind of fell apart and I was, you know, getting buried or whatever you want to say. Like I was so, ugh, I was so negative and down and like poor me and bitching and moaning. I think I invented the, the, the passive aggressive wrestling tweet, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> right. And then I, I don't know why I just, I realized like one day, like just stop this bullshit whining, right? Like it's not changing your position at work. You're not happy at home. Let's what what can we control in this situation, right? And I, I, as ridiculous as it sounds, I realized in WWE, this is my opinion, and of course I'm pitching to the writers, I'm pitching ideas. I'm not saying I didn't do any of that, but the three things I could absolutely 100% control were my physique, right? Nobody could say you can't work out hard or you can't look like a million bucks. Uh, my my ring attire, my gear. Nobody could say you can't have cool looking ring gear. It's, this is ridiculous what I'm saying. Even just speaking it, I, it sounds ridiculous. And the last Dude, I, I liked the real quick about the ring gear. I liked the one long leg ring gear. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that was good. It. Thank you. Um, and the other thing I could control was my attitude, right? Nobody could tell me I could have a smile on my face or be positive or be optimistic. And when I really just focused on those three things, as ridiculous as it may sound, things started to turn around. Coincidence? I don't know. But it did. Uh, fast forward to getting released from WWE. I control everything. Yeah. There's more than three. I'm literally controlling every single thing. So the pressure's on, right? But it's a good pressure. It's pressure I love. Uh, and, and sometimes my brain's all over the place because I'm thinking of something. And then I start thinking about something else. I forget about the thing I was thinking about. You know, like my life is a, a chaotic mess right now. But I'm in control of every single aspect. Is that good or bad? I don't know. But I think that's why I've been so successful outside WWE because I love it. I, I love the the wrestling. I love the the entertainment aspect, the merchandise aspect, the connection with the fans. I, and at the end of the day, I'm living my dream. The only thing I ever wanted to do was be a pro wrestler. And I'm doing it on my own terms and more successful I say that, I, I say that in quotes, but however you want to find success, the most successful I've ever been. I love it. So obviously, you know, when we think about the future of your career, you've got many, many years left, but who would you want to retire you? If you could choose anybody from past, future, it doesn't matter. Who would you want to retire you? Man, it, it's, there's definitely some guys that I'd like to get in the ring with before they retire. Someone like, uh, like Edge, Adam Copeland from AEW, when WWE, uh, when I really got my, my first break was from him. I was, he was edge. I was one of his edge heads, one of his little crony guys. Uh, I would love to have that match, but now on the independence, it, it's making me feel old when, when I'm saying this, but like, there are guys that I wrestle and like, Hey, you were my favorite wrestler. I used to watch your YouTube show every week. You know, so I'm like, <laughs> what? Yeah. So like, just, just wrestling like those guys. So I think when it's all said and done, I'd, I'd like someone to retire me who was like a diehard or even just a, someone who I inspired. I would love to kind of pass the torch to them, but sorry, pal, not anytime soon. <laughs> no, yeah, you got you've got plenty of time, man. And I yeah. think too, like first of all, you're in the best shape of your career, in my opinion, right? 
Second of all, when you, and I, I have a little bit of still a child in myself as well, obviously some of this conversation we had, you could tell, I think when you have that longevity is real, right? Like we don't age like the rest of the people who are already oh. stuck in their sixties or whatever. Oh. I turned 40 in August and I had a bit of a midlife crisis and I was like, hold up. I got plenty of time. Right. I got plenty of time, but, uh, but dude, I've, I've loved this conversation. I want to wrap up the conversation with a question I ask everybody, but before we get there, how do people find you, follow you, listen to your podcast? What's all the good stuff? Uh, I'm on all the social media. I'm the internet champion after all, uh, at the Matt Cardona on X, I guess it's called now X yeah. Instagram. Uh, I have the major wrestling figure podcast. If you're into wrestling collectibles, my own toy line, uh, major bendies. So I have too much stuff to plug. We'd have another hour to fill up just stuff that I'm plugging, which is, I guess is a good thing. Yeah. And then obviously wrestling tees.com slash Matt Cardona. Oh uh, yeah. Pro wrestling tees.com. Pro wrestling tees. What did I say? Pro wrestling tees. You get the, you get the Emmy God, the new Emmy God shirt available now. Dude. I love it. I'm excited for Actually. I really like that guy as an actor. Uh, if you haven't seen what's it called? Blackbird. It's phenomenal. I, I I gotta check it's it out. phenomenal. Check it out before you wrestle him. And then you can actually yeah, use right. his character in some way, oh, shape I, or form. I, hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, dude. I love it. So like I said, I wrap up every single interview with the same question. Since the show is called the growth now movement, that question is in your life. What has been your biggest moment of growth? Hmm. That's a, that's a hard hitting question. I'll save the best for last. I think just when I decided when we were talking about it earlier, like enough, just like bullshit, being negative, being pessimistic, even though I'm not naturally positive, just like flipping the switch and realizing, all right, what can, what can I control? And just attacking those things, whatever they are in your life that you can control. I'm not necessarily saying you have to fix the situation you're in, but just in general to, 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 to move, to grow, to thrive, just focus on the things you can control and absolutely fucking kill them, you know, thrive, uh, and, and at least the best you can. Right. Yeah, Matt, thank you so much, man, for bringing back nostalgia, for pouring your heart and soul into the, the craft that you do that entertains countless people around the world, man. This has been great. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks for having me, bro. It's been good. Thank you.